Welcome to Technically, a webinar series dedicated to the technical challenges of making the web accessible. This month, our presenter is Mallory Van Achterberg, Senior Accessibility Consultant at Tenon. Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, June 2019 edition of Technically. I'm Michael Beck, the Operations Manager at Tenon, and you're a beloved host and moderator of this incredible webinar series that we have going on here. Um, seriously, uh, this wealth of knowledge, the good practical knowledge that we've gathered here is, is pretty astounding, and I, I do sincerely mean we. Uh, the questions that you've asked of our presenters have only served to flesh out and uh, all flesh out the details and make information more relevant, more actionable, and most invaluable of all, um, inv invaluable, I guess, I guess you can say. <laughs> Uh, so before we get to this month's topic, uh, please give yourselves a round of applause, a uh, pat on the back, or perhaps a treat, perhaps treat yourself to something extra delicious today. Uh, oh, speaking of which, uh, Eid Mubarak to any of our Muslim attendees who may be taking a break from their festivities. Uh, you really do deserve something delicious today. Uh, a quick note for those of you who were expecting Rian Rietveld today, um, as I announced at the end of last month's webisode, uh, we had to reschedule her. She'll be presenting in August. This month, we have Tenon's own Mallory Van Achterberg with us. Um, she's in the hot seat. Hello, Mallory. Hello. Uh, now, longtime attendees know that Mallory is one of the more vocal members of the peanut gallery, as it were. Uh, but this time, I've gone and turned the tables on her, and she'll be talking about designing and coding for users with low vision. Uh, and before I hand the reins over to her as a technically first, Mallory has made her slide deck available to you so you can use your own device and whatever assistive technologies at your disposal to follow along instead of just relying solely on the video feed here from Zoom. Um, I'll put that link in the chat box right now for those of us on the live feed and it will be down in the description if you're watching later on YouTube. Uh, so that's it for me, and take it away, Mallory. Okay. I'm going to be talking about designing and coding for low vision. I'm going to be going over specific parts, and I will have practical tips when tips are something people can do anything about. Uh, when people think about accessibility on the web, they seem to like to focus on blind users. I'm guessing because as developers, we're used to solving problems with code and screen readers are very code sensitive, but there are a really small number of people. There's much larger groups of people that uh, we should get ourselves with, um, but I'm going to focus on the low vision folks. First, I'm going to go through a group of typical vision issues. It won't be all of them. Uh, but the first and sort of the most common popular one would be just acuity. Things are not sharp. This is one of my eye problems. And I can wear glasses for things that are far away. Uh, but to make things sharp, the glasses make things very, very tiny. So what I'm more likely to do is to get closer to the thing or zoom in. Another one is cataracts, which can cause both blurriness, like we saw before, and it can lower contrast. And a lot of people don't notice right away if they have something slow and progressive like cataracts that their vision has deteriorated. This is my only moving slide, I promise, but with diabetic retinopathy, you have blood clots floating around in your eyes while your vision is slowly degrading. With glaucoma, you lose peripheral vision. So you could see things mostly in the center. Whereas with macular degeneration and other things, it's, it's peripheral vision is all you have. And this would be a group who would be more likely to zoom out, for example, rather than zoom in. And color blindness is not new to anybody, and yet we keep forgetting about it as we design things. So there's various ways People with low vision can deal with it. 
and I'm going to go through those. They could use a text-to-speech engine. They might use a screen reader, but that really is a very complex piece of software. There are also much simpler text-to-speech engines that usually will highlight where it's reading or read where the mouse is, but that's one thing some people can use. What may surprise people is that zooming out can be a thing. I'm showing a slide from a talk by Damien, which is a really great talk. And in my slides, I link to his or their slides. But if you can find the talk online, it's really great. In the talk, he explains that most people, when they're reading, rely on the shape of the words to tell what it is. And if you're really zoomed in and you can't see the entire word or you can only see one or two words, then you lose that speediness you get by recognizing shapes of words. You can make the fonts larger in your operating system, but that doesn't mean that all the applications running on your computer actually listen to it. I had a heck of a time setting up passcode because the line heights were apparently very rigid. Most operating systems have a magnification software built in, although the one for Linux kind of has been abandoned. Uh, and there are third party screen magnification programs. The thing about screen magnification is it's as if you have a credit card sized view of the entire screen and you move that view around by moving your mouse or if the application supports it by in keyboard focus as you tab around that little magnified viewport will also move with it. But you'd be surprised how many people just lower the screen resolution because the application just doesn't make the fonts large enough. So if I'm down by 600 by 800, I can actually see some of the text on Dragon's startup window. Another example is the GIMP, something ported from Linux. If I actually want to read it, I have to lower my screen resolution. So if you hear people saying, nobody uses 600 by 800 anymore, that's not entirely true. Most operating systems have a high contrast setting, which is great, but I'm going to specifically call out Windows high contrast because this tries to really ensure that you, the minimum contrast is really high, at least seven to one, if not higher. This is not the same as uh, reverse color or inverse video. This is definitely special. So I always make a special call out for Windows high contrast. If you need really high contrast, Windows has excellent high contrast. And unlike a plugin that might be sitting on a browser or an application, this is operating system wide, so long as the application listens to it, which not all applications do. And there's always the good old nose to the screen. This is still a thing. If you want to have the text seem larger without only seeing parts of a word, sticking your face right up against the screen is sometimes the best way to go. So there are very typical problems that come with low vision, which I think if I show them, my goal is that those watching come across something that they hadn't thought of and will think about it the next project that they do. So one is magnified scrolling. You can't do anything about this. If you're using a screen magnifier, if I want to read a sentence, I have to go from left to right. And there's nothing any designer or developer can do about this. Text doesn't wrap inside magnified viewing because that's just not how it works. However, for people who are using browser zoom, that is something you can do something about. Here in GitHub, if I want to read this comment, I have to scroll from left to right and back again. That's not cool. Same with Gmail, which I actually can't use this view. I have to use the plain HTML view, which still means I have to scroll, but at least then I don't have two huge sticky things wasting lots of my screen real estate. Don't do that. So with, um, I'm using GitHub's code here and I'm using one of their pre-existing breakpoints. I don't set my breakpoints in pixels, but an example of what you could do is if the screen is smaller, undo floats and let widths be auto. That wouldn't work on GitHub alone because there's a few other things that also have widths set on them, but also because they use Flexbox in the header. 
Flexbox is something I'm starting to see more and more as, as causing issues. And I'm showing CSS tricks in my slide, uh, mostly because it's mostly done pretty well. They are mobile responsive and their Flexbox is really clean. So it's easy to show that in this example, I have the logo, I have a search control of some sort, and then another control is off screen. And that's because that whole header area is a flex container. If we let things wrap, at least I would have access to it. The default for flex wrap is no wrap. If you have a flex container and things in a horizontal row, you have to check if you zoom in whether or not those things can wrap if they need to. And again, you can use a media query. And again, I've grabbed one that was already on the CSS tricks page. This is just an ugly but functional thing, which is fine. You could also, of course, make it all pretty if you wanted to. Getting lost is very common when you're zoomed in quite a bit. And it gets worse when excessive white space is used for design reasons. Lots and lots of white space looks clean. So many websites are using a lot of it, but then at some point you run out of landmarks. And I wanted to make a special note of cards that are usually very large clickable areas that have a bunch of text. Now, Rian will be talking in depth about cards on another technically, but I wanted to mention them here because I've seen cards that are not done well like this one. This one's from the Event Apart website, which does it well. I can still read this. They darken the text slightly when you mouse over it. But in other places, I've seen it where everything gets completely dark or the text is replaced with some other text or a picture is loaded on top. And what I want people to keep in mind is that for some people, the only view they have of the thing on the page is the hovered view. There is no default view because you can't get something into your viewport without either moving the mouse there or moving keyboard focus there. There are ways to get around that with the screen magnification software. You can use something where there's an unmagnified part to help orient where you are and then a magnified part to read. You can have it attached to your mouse, which I think I just heard Apple's recent, uh, they had some big update and they've got something like this now, which is, which is nice. Or you can dock part of it. Docking is not great unless you have multiple monitors. In my view, I tend to always do full screen. And if I need to orient, I'll turn off the magnification, figure out where I am, turn it back on. But if you have got multiple monitors, this is not an uncommon setup to have the magnified and the unmagnified views on separate monitors but it's not always useful if you don't have the room to do that. And big issue is autofocus. Autofocus is just throwing you someplace on a page and the screenshot is from GitHub from a couple of years ago. I'll go back and we'll see, this is what GitHub looked like and you would autofocus on the pick a username, despite the fact that the website has lots and lots of links and lots of buttons and lots of things you could do, they assumed Everyone coming to github.com doesn't have an account. And if I moved my mouse down, I would see the your email address. And this is not cool. They had a label. It was technically accessible for a screen reader, but the label was hidden and they relied on placeholders, which vanished when you were autofocused on something. That's not cool. Be very careful with autofocus. The site sh should be doing one thing and one thing at all. Then you can use autofocus, it can be useful, but if there's multiple things people can do, no, don't do it. Another issue that we see a lot is, I'm showing an example from WordPress. If you're on the back end of WordPress, there's a media library where you can choose an image and next to the, where the images are, there's attachment details, which has a form. If the right side was scrolled down a bit, you would see form fields. But once you're zoomed in a bit, the form fields visually vanish, but they're still there. They're just being covered up. All this stuff here is very sticky. The top part is sticky, the bottom part is sticky. Everything is absolutely positioned. And so my rule is, if I can't see it, don't let me tap to it. That's bad. 
it's very common for a lot of websites to try to show a subtle response to people, a growler that comes up from the bottom or an alert that's in the upper left-hand corner. Or in this case, on e-commerce, it's very common to have um, a shopping cart in the upper right-hand corner. And so if I order something and I put it in my cart, this will change, which is good. But when I'm zoomed in, or if I'm just a person who has a cognitive issue where I, I need to work very hard to focus on my task or whatever, I may only see this and I'm not going to necessarily see changes that are on the upper right or upper left or in the bottom. So one thing you can do is say I want three items I want to order and I click my order button, sorry that it's in Dutch, that a couple things happen in this example first the button becomes disabled so that I can't click it again to accidentally order six of the items. But because disabled buttons can't hold focus, we don't want to lose our focus. So JavaScript is carefully putting it back on the previous input where I can change that number, which would reactivate the button. And underneath it says in Dutch that it's in my shopping cart. That's local feedback in multiple ways. That's very cool try to think of adding local feedback. This is something designers need to think of first. An example of screwing it up is Trello. Trello is a good example of a lot of things being screwed up, but one is if you have an error that you put at the top of the page, then I'm not gonna see it. Don't do that. There's another trend that's been going on the web, which is showing keyboard focus for keyboarders and hiding it from mouse users. Now, earlier I said getting lost is really common. And one of the things I do when I'm getting lost, when I'm using screen magnification is I'll switch to keyboard and I'll start tabbing, especially if I know there's a button or link I wanna to get to, but I can't find it visually by waving my mouse around, I'll tab. And what I'm showing here is a website where I've, I've tabbed to a button and we can see it's not very high contrast, but there is a focus outline and usually, what I do is I tab to something and then I explore from that point. This is my landmark. But if I move my mouse, what this site is running, the moment it detects a mouse move, it removes the keyboard focus. And that's not cool. So the particular website I was showing uses something called what input. And by default, apparently, if you do a mouse move, it'll do its thing. Now you can set it up that it listens only for a mouse down, but the attribute that what input uses by default, if it sees a mouse move, it will change its attribute to mouse from keyboard. And so if you're using something like this, be sure to, if you have to do this at all, be sure to listen for an actual click rather than just the mouse got bumped or the mouse got moved. Sticky headers. Oh, sticky headers. I hate sticky headers. Sticky headers are probably the worst thing I run into on the web. Don't do them. Here's an example from Gutenberg where there are stacked sticky headers. The name of the article we're editing is on top and underneath is the section that we've opened where you can choose between block or document settings. And all I have is a tiny little scrollable area on the bottom. Don't stack stickies. Cookies are often sticky and Trello at least makes them sort of mobile responsive, it squishes, but because it's absolutely positioned and stuck to the bottom, I can't see the top and I can't scroll up any higher. Uh, even more common is the button to close the cookie warning or to uh, accept the cookies is off to the right, but because it's position fixed, I can't scroll to the right because you can't scroll fixed position things. LinkedIn is a terrible example of this. Don't make your cookies sticky. It's very popular to have a drop down menu stuck to a sticky header, meaning that if you open up the menu, you can't scroll down to reach the bottom of the menu. Don't do that. There's a mobile version of what I showed was Twitter. This is a mobile Twitter. Uh, but while the mobile version looks actually pretty good on the portrait mode of a phone, I'm gonna get a mobile view if I'm zoomed in on a desktop and the difference is a desktop is going to look more like a landscape orientation than a portrait. And now the height matters. You get huge things covering up text. Don't do that. 
The menu is better though. I have a large scrollable area. So the menu has been fixed by, it's still stuck to the left, but it's been fixed by giving me a larger scrollable area. Another example is T-Mobile, which has a drop down menu of like 40 items. It's huge, but they are mobile responsive, so I can zoom in, right? But when I do, there's a big empty sticky thing on the top and I can only see a couple of items at a time. And additionally, they've put title attributes on the links with nothing but a smaller version of the text that's already in the link. So it gets in my way and makes things more unreadable. Don't do that. You can test for a, a height and I have some example code where I'm using a max height of 10 M, but whether you're going to use a min height or a max height and whether you use 10 M or something else is going to depend on how big your sticky is does content inside it wrap as people zoom in? You have to check it yourself on a browser to find the numbers that work best for you. That way, if the designer or somebody else insists that something is sticky, that that's not sticky once people start moving in and their height of their viewport is limited. Tooltips and pop-ups have issues. Most designers and developers do it right with drop down menus where we're used to hovering over a menu item and a drop down appears and then your mouse can go over that new drop down that's appeared and it stays on the screen. But sometimes people forget to do that with tooltips. An example of where it's not been done is Jira. I moused over a button and it has this big tooltip that shows up, but I can't read it because to move back and forth to see all of it, I have to move my mouse back and forth which means my mouse is no longer on the button, which means it vanishes. It's unreadable. So the tooltip itself should stay as my mouse moves over it. It can also be the other way around where it, it does stay on mouse over. I'm showing a screenshot from Twitter where if you accidentally mouse over, say a username, you get a whole huge bio, which is good if I want to read it, but it's bad if I want it to go away. I should be able to close this without having to carefully navigate my mouse around it and out of the edges. For example, by hitting the escape key, or you could make it that wherever my mouse is, if it's not on a link, that clicking there could maybe make it go away. And for this reason, I'm not a huge fan of CSS tooltips because it's difficult to have the closing with something else without moving the focus or the mouse generally JavaScript. I have seen a very complex CSS solution to this, but it was a very complex CSS solution. Title attributes in general, you can't do those kinds of things like making it hoverable or making it vanish because it's generated by the browser. So by adding a title attribute, this, this pop-up uh, just shows up and the developer has no control over it. I'm showing a screenshot from wordpress.org, which this has been fixed. This was an issue that they had in their tracker. And somebody was arguing that, well, the title attributes were just nice. They were just extras. They were injecting a bit of fun into the page. But I showed with this screenshot that I can't read enough of it to tell if it's important. Do I need to read this? I can't, because as soon as my mouse moves to the right, I'm not hovering on plugins and it vanishes. And some people like putting title attributes on containers, which is awful because everywhere your mouse goes, the stupid little title tooltip shows up and it covers things, making stuff hard to read. And depending on the browser, it may or may not vanish after a certain period of time. Avoid title attributes. Really think twice if you think you need them. Windows high contrast is one of my favorite topics. I'm showing an example of sort of a custom form styling page. This is old. This was developed by one of the Twitter guys. And this is a styled select dropdown. And it's fairly accessible. It uses an actual select with actual options. It does everything a select does, but it looks funky. In Windows High Contrast, it looks like nothing. You can't tell what it is. Be careful styling custom form controls. There are two things I can always tell people to do that should just work without having to use special high contrast media queries or anything. One is you can always put a transparent border around the element itself. Then people can see where the hit area is of the thing. 
And you can use a transparent outline on focus to show this is what it looks like focused because the original uses a box shadow. I didn't take a screenshot of it, but box shadows do not show up in Windows High Contrast for good reason. Here we can see what the thing is and we can see that it is focused, but we're still missing the arrow. And for me to know that this is an, uh, a drop down, I have to see that arrow. That arrow is a very important visual cue for me. But because it's got a, it's a CSS technique arrow that we've been using for years where it's two transparent borders plus a visible border, we should use something else like SVGs. But be careful with SVGs. It's very common for programs that people use to make SVGs to put in an inline fill or stroke color in the actual SVG code. Don't do that because we can't guarantee that the contrast is good. What I typically tell people to do if the SVG has just one color, whether it's stroke or fill, is to set the color you want on a parent element as a color property and then have the SVG have its fill or it could be a stroke set to current color. Because what that does is as the high contrast theme changes text color, the SVG will come along with it and that will ensure that the contrast is as high as it is for the text. Now you might have an SVG with more color, in which case this trick won't work. I say for those people to give their SVGs a background color, normally it's transparent. If you set a background color to your SVGs that is the same as the background color of the web page, then only high contrast users will even see there's a background, but that will ensure that the contrast is high enough and that the SVGs are visible. And states. This is a big one. People like to use color alone to denote states. I'm showing a login form with a disabled submit button, which I'm not particularly a fan of, but my high, my high contrast theme here uses green to denote that things are disabled. So this person make a button, they put in disabled and it works. But custom buttons are all the rage. And here the developer attempted to do everything right. They gave it a roll of button, they gave it a negative tab index and they set ARIA disabled to true. But ARIA disabled is a thing for screen readers. It doesn't show up for high contrast because the operating system of Windows knows nothing about ARIA and it never will. But opacity is something that works. This has been my go-to suggestion for uh, clients who say, how do we show that our custom element is disabled? You could lower the opacity because it'll look like this, which I think it works a lot. But what I want people to think about is there's lots of states that you need to be aware of. Use outline for focus states, but it's very common for an error state to only change the border color of an input to red. Make sure that instead there's also a small icon, an SVG icon, and that the error message is close by and maybe the error message even says something about error. If you have a bunch of buttons and one of them is a rea pressed, you have to be careful that that pressed state is not going to show up. Or if you make a custom drop down where the currently selected item in the drop down has a different background color, that doesn't show up in high contrast. In addition to the background color, think of something else such as perhaps that's the only bold text option. Low contrast is something people hear about a lot. They're constantly hearing about uh, contrast on websites is too low. But no matter how often you hear it, it's just still, it's just still a thing. It's something designers really like because it looks professional or something. I have a link on my slides going to a discussion about the algorithm that is used for the WCAG uh, luminosity contrast ratio, because sometimes something will technically pass some color combination and everyone looking at it says, but that's not readable. If we switch to something else it, that may help stop those false positives from popping up so much, but if that comes, it's going to be in the future, but it's a very long, interesting thread if you're interested in that algorithm and where it comes from and what it might be replaced with. It's a really good read. There is a new trend I've been seeing on several websites. The text has plenty of contrast, but the links are denoted with something that's got practically no contrast, such as yellow on white. Don't do that. Egghead.io uses blue on white. 
Now here, from the text, you know, we have the word links above what are clearly links. We have, this happens to be a page about Marcy Sutton. It's got what are clearly her Twitter, her website, her GitHub. But how would you know the word transcript was a link? It looks like a heading. Don't do that. Luckily in Windows High Contrast, if you marked it up as a link, it will look like a link regardless of how badly it was styled. But that doesn't mean set everything to black on white or white on black. Very high contrast is not easy to read. It gets in the way of people with reading disabilities. It can be a problem for people with dyslexia. It can make letters look like they're jumping. I have an example of uh, a designer I know who has low vision and she needs very, very, very low contrast to read stuff. So her own website wouldn't pass the WCAG minimum, but this allows her to read it. I do have a trick for people who want to really quickly throw on a low contrast widget. This is not a good thing to do, but uh, it can work. You can throw on an overlay and then have pointer event set to none so that you can still click stuff. Uh, but most websites that allow people to log in, you can actually dedicate time to making a lower contrast theme if you want. Some of the reading plugins will lower contrast. And I've seen it on a few magazines, online magazines, that expect people to spend a lot of time reading. But it's more common to find a high contrast plugin than to find a low contrast plugin. And lastly, colorblindness is something we all, we know about it, we hear about it and we keep forgetting it because stuff like this keeps happening. I don't know how many hundreds of people were involved in setting up a big American football game, but nobody noticed the problem with red jerseys versus green jerseys on a green grass field until after it was on television where people would call in saying, I can't tell who's on what team. Or for developers showing whether or not a build is passing or failing using only color instead of additionally a symbol, an icon, or some text is a bad idea. And we still keep seeing color alone being used to show some information. Don't do that. Here's an example of a switch I found. They're clearly trying to imitate Apple's little check boxes that look like switches. But first of all, if I can't see the colors, which here they, they do have green, for when it's on and there is a directional difference but i can't remember which direction is the checked direction because i'm terrible at that and i don't have any apple devices and if there was something else like a checkbox or something some check mark that let me know that would be better but this this was pretty bad i, I couldn't look at it and just tell is it already selected or is it not selected and in windows high contrast it's actually completely invisible, except in these screenshots, you can see a border around the track because I'm focused on it with keyboard. Otherwise, it was completely invisible. Once you decide you want to make a custom control, you now get the responsibility of ensuring that it is as visible as the default native control. Don't do that. So what should we do? Long list. I don't think people are going to remember all of these things, but I do hope that some of these things are in mind. Do mobile responsive, but keep in mind that height can be just as important as width because almost all media queries I see are based on the width of the viewport, but height is also good and you can test with browser zoom. If you use Flexbox, check the containers by zooming in. At some point, something might go off screen, let the stuff wrap. Designers, when you're designing the general page look, use visual landmarks, use consistency in things like alignments, distance between headings and stuff that they had, and use white space. It's very important, but don't use huge, crazy amounts of it, please. Don't use autofocus unless the page has one dedicated goal. Like if there's also a footer full of links, that's fine, but a login page can have autofocus, but a page that happens to have multiple forms, no. Don't let me tab on stuff I can't see. Make feedback local so that if it's on the edge, I didn't miss it. 
Think twice and then think a third time before removing keyboard focus styles. Kill all stickies, please, for the love of God. Kill stickies. Make sure tooltips and anything else that shows up on hover focus is both hoverable and dismissible. Keep Windows high contrast in mind. Use decent contrast. Stop forgetting about color blindness and just test everything. Almost everything I've shown, with the exception of stuff viewed through a third party expensive screen magnification program is stuff that anybody, developer or designer without special accessibility knowledge can check for. So I would just love everyone to just try zooming in, check this stuff, make sure it still works. And that's my talk. All right. Well, thank you, Mallory. <clears throat> Excuse me. seems like I got a frog in my throat now. Anyone have any questions? Just go ahead and throw that up in the chat box. If you do. Means everyone fell asleep. Oh, here we go. Uh, Doug asks if uh, you have any good examples of SVGs. <laughs> as far as SVGs that look good or I mean, mostly what it happens is I'm testing a page or I'm viewing a page and when I turn on high contrast, a lot of people have dark colored SVGs, dark gray or black on a white web page and they look fine. And then when I switch to high contrast, I never use the white. There is a white contrast theme, but whenever it's dark, it always is, I have dark gray symbols on a black page and they're invisible, they're just gone. Um, and most of the time then I'll check to see, is there an inline color actually in the SVG? Or sometimes somebody will just set the fill in the CSS instead of telling it to inherit from the current color. That's almost always the problem when I run into it. And uh, he, he specifically, uh, uh, URL, uh, a URL for an icon for low vision, or URL of an icon for low vision. No, I've... I've seen people use media queries to switch their icons, which I don't do because I think it's a lot of work, but uh, I've not looked specifically for low vision icons, although that would be a good thing to look at is if an icon has a lot of detail, it's, it's not unlikely that the bits of the detail might not be visible, in which case if you have an icon that looks like a, a circle and another icon that's a circle with a, a little tail, that might look exactly the same and having more room. There's a name for that thing that letters have the gaps in the letters, like the circle inside the letter a that it's the same thing holds for symbols. It has to be large enough that people can discern what that thing's shape is, mm -hmm. but I don't have a, a URL. I never look for special low vision icons. I'm sure somebody's made some Microsoft probably has some. That's a good point. Um, let's see. Isabella asks, I uh, work for an agency that re focuses on visual design. How can I work with them to ensure they don't feel like their designs are being compromised, um, yet still be accessible? She feels like when she says things like, don't do parallax, don't do scroll jacking, don't do sticky, they take it as um, she's killing their creativity. And she wants to find options to work with them. Yeah, that's any, difficult. Uh, any, 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 yeah, <laughs> and any uh, any 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 buzzwords you think that uh, might might help? Actually, when I worked with designers at Pearson, a lot of them asked why or how come, and they all wanted stuff to be accessible. I never had to argue with anyone at Pearson to make stuff accessible, which was really really great. I loved that. I never had to fight about it. And what I could do was I could show people, well, this is what my experience looks like. Uh, that's a little difficult with Zoom text, for example. It sits on top of your GPU and you can't use something like Zoom or Google Hangouts and show the magnified view. But I could take screenshots and I could say, this is what I have. This is what your design looks like on my end. And I am a fan of seeing how much of the design you can keep and only adjusting it if certain things happen. For example, having sticky crap, but once the viewport height starts getting too 
low, removing it, because at that point, the page doesn't look like the design anyway. Or mm. for the SVGs, people want a certain color. You can style it with a certain color, but if you do it in a certain way where if I'm switching to a high contrast theme, I get my own colors. Well, at that point, your design doesn't look anything like what you thought of anyway. So I will try often to work with the designers to say, well, what, what do you think are the options? Some designers really thrive on having constraints and others don't. But if they do, they usually come up with stuff. Well, can I do it this way? Or could I do it this way? If you're lucky enough to have a direct dialogue with designers, let them come up with a whole bunch of crap. Show them what the problem looks like. Let them think it through. And chances are they'll come up with something where like you could do something like that and then we could do this and then we could do that. Sometimes it's okay, let's add a control to the page or make it a setting if somebody's logged in that has a different design, but the default is still what they were originally going for. I'm a huge fan of seeing visible text labels of indecipherable hieroglyphics on buttons. Designers love icons on buttons. I hate it. I don't know what they mean. <laughs> if there was an option for me to click a checkbox, it says, just show the visual labels like they have on Gmail. On Gmail, that's one of the options. Mm -hmm. If you're using the HTML, or sorry, if you're using the CSS uh, version, the fancy version, you can say, hey, I only care about icons because I, I'm not a good reader or I want the text with the icons. It's a setting. The original design was probably just with the hieroglyphics, but with an option, you can let people change it to, yeah, but I need the text or other way around. Somebody asked, I could see now what tools to use for Zoom. In a browser, control plus and control minus work for every browser I know of, and it often works with PDF viewers as well. I once found a website for a blood bank that it looked like it had one of those text and large widgets. It had a, a, a small a, a middle a, and a big a, but when you clicked it, it was actually a link to a web page that told you how to enlarge and shrink the text with your browser. It was brilliant. They don't have it anymore, but I loved that because people in my country are used to those little widgets for text and large that you see on websites. That is quite brilliant. That, like, I, that, I, wish awesome. yeah, I wish they had kept it. I wish they had kept it because it was, it was amazing because now people, they go to click it. That means it's the people who need that. They're clicking it and then they get told, hey, you can make all websites bigger text. Oh, it's like it's almost like you have to trick people in the in, in the learning. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, let's see. I wish I had shown scroll jacking actually, because I've run into pages that do that, and when it's done with JavaScript, the problem is usually if there's text anywhere near the bottom of the quote unquote slide that they're showing. I can't read it because it's off screen and I can't scroll down because when I try to scroll, it's gone. So I only see a little bit of text, but I know the CSS working group is working on making that a CSS property. I don't know if it's going to make it for CSS4 as a module, but I know they're busy working on it. And one of the things it would have is the browser would kind of automatically negate that scroll jacking functionality if somebody zoomed in or it would do things to ensure that if the contents of the slide that you have go outside the viewport, that it would let you scroll down to the bottom of that slide before jumping you to the next one, which I'm looking forward to. When I first heard of it, I was like, no, we can't have scroll jacking in CSS. But after I saw how it worked, I was like, oh, this is great. This will be better. It's sort of like when they added placeholder to HTML5. Because most browsers still show the placeholder even after you focus nowadays, it's better than the old JavaScript one where it would always vanish the moment you focused on it. All righty. All the slides, it's just one big HTML page. So if you went to the URL, uh, you can just copy it. It's a folder. It has an HTML page, a CSS file, a JavaScript file, and a bunch of images. Uh, but we are working on sitting it on Dropbox in a way that if you want to just grab the whole folder and download it, Michael's working on that. Yep. <laughs> we'll post that uh, somewhere. <clears throat> yep. Uh, yeah, James um, had uh, mentioned that uh, you can try to sell it as a challenge to the designers, which is you, you kind of basically said that in much... 
It, it can. Uh, it depends. You know. It depends on the designer. Yeah. Some designers are, they like pushing the envelope, trying new things, and they work better with constraints. There are other people who that doesn't work for them and yeah. they have yeah. certain things they want or certain things that a CEO or somebody or a client said that they really wanted. And then it starts getting into hacks and shoehorning so that it, that somebody gets what they want, but that somehow it can be made to work for somebody else's needs. But I think if more designers could see how stuff looks to those of us who have to adjust it and mm -hmm. they see us struggling, or I believe it's Basecamp 37 Signals, some company like that, their rule was anything anybody built, they were forced to go into a room and watch users use it. That's I think every, every company should do that and enforce mm -hmm. that. I don't care if it's remote video. You get to watch somebody go, well, how do, where do I go next? Well, exactly. What's this thing do? Uh, that, that is a great policy. Yes. Should even, be every, I, I mean, even just having someone, a designer do that once or twice is going to have an impression on them. But making right, them, it might get them thinking. I exactly. Mean, making them do it all the time is going to really get them thinking. Though. Yeah. And somebody says something about calls to action. Uh, so with, with icons on, on buttons, I call them hieroglyphics because a lot of time I, I can't tell, like I've started to guess that the, the spiky circle is settings, but there's a lot of them I just don't know. I have another talk I gave about icons where I showed some quote unquote icons, everybody knows what they mean, but I found lots of instances of them meaning different things. So again, the idea of if you could then add a control where maybe the default is an icon, but there's some way for a user who doesn't understand it to go find the text. I'm a developer, so I, I right click on stuff, I inspect the element and I try to see if there's a class name or something hidden or maybe hidden stuff for screen reader users so I can guess what the thing does before I click it because I don't trust clicking stuff. But you could build that in. You could have either a checkbox or a setting or something where the default is still sort of the general wish of the designer is this because they have, that is a good reason of icons make things clear and compact and lots and lots of text is, is pretty much the opposite of what you want for people who have trouble reading, for example. People with low literacy, people with dyslexia often want less text. They want as so minimum amount necessary to convey the meaning and icons are really great for that. But there's the other way around where, yeah, I can't recognize what your icon means. So making the page as flexible as possible for people is, that's a sort of general thing in accessibility anyway. The user needs to be able to choose how they consume the content, how they interact with the thing. And the more control they have within reason is generally better especially so long as it's not really difficult to figure out how to get that control. A lot of the tools I showed, there's a lot of people when their vision degrades, all they do is stick their nose closer to the screen. They've never heard of a screen reader. They've mm -hmm. never heard of screen magnification. That stuff is, is they don't know anybody who does that. The eye doctors don't know anything about it. They never tell their patients, oh, you could use this. Yeah, or at, at best they'll have one of those uh, ma giant magnifying glass overlays to go over the monitor. Yeah, and at, at best, and that works, at and that best. works. Um, you do what you do. People are going to do what they do. People, and as your vision goes down, we're visual creatures. We will use every last little bit of our vision, even when it gets to the point where, to be honest, we would have been faster, happier, and more efficient if we just switched over to a screen reader. But it's if you have so much of your brain dedicated to visual processing, yeah, people are going to use every last little bit of vision. That's what we do. We try to strain to see our little bits. My dear mother only got reading glasses when it be, her arms were, weren't long enough for her to read something. That's she, she was common. Always, well, exactly. It's very common. And that, that it, it goes exactly to your point that we're, we're stretching our vision to the, to the limit, even even though we have all this available technology to us, this old yeah. technology, even like like reading glasses, <laughs> of all things. Um, but yeah, that the more people know about the tools that they can use on a computer, the better. Yeah. Uh, there, so there was one question in the in the actual Q and A thing, uh, 
an anonymous attendee wanted to know more about stickies in regards to main navigation. One of your favorite topics. <clears throat> yeah, sticky is my favorite topic. There's even a GitHub issue mentioned by Wayne Dick, who is on the Low Vision Task Force at the W3C, who helped add some of the new WCAG 2.1 success criteria that are focused on reflow. And he mentioned, boy, our, our how to meet page should say something about stickies and somebody else, I think it was Jake Abma, came up with an example that either will be or maybe already is on the, either the understanding page or the how to, how to meet the success criteria page. There's been more discussion about it when, when sticky things start eating up so much screen real estate. The guidelines will never be hard and set though, because it's, it's, there's too many possible combinations and the WCAG tries to be very, very technologically uh, agnostic and it doesn't want to set anything too hard. A rule of thumb is like if something sticky takes up more than a quarter of the visual viewport in a zoomed in browser, for instance, then that's starting to get to be too much. But some people are okay with something taking half the room. I, I don't like it, but there's other people saying, well, that would be okay, blah, blah, blah. The reason people make stuff sticky is they want something to be available for mouse users without having to do a whole lot of movement. And for example, if you're a mouse user with limited mobility where using a mouse is, is difficult, but you do it or you use a, a head mouse, having stuff at a close distance is an accessibility improvement. But for a low vision enough. person zoomed in, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. And that's why I like the idea of, of if the viewport has a certain smallness to it, then maybe we'll let just stuff scroll by. So it doesn't remove it from the page, but if something becomes position static, if it was at the top of the page, that's where it is. And I, I scroll away from it. Or if it was on the left side of the page, I scroll away from it. Or if it's at the bottom, I only see it once I get to the bottom something like that. With cookies, I almost want to tell people, always put your cookie warnings as at the top of the page, but also the first thing in the DOM order so that my first tab goes to the stuff for closing it. Because if it's at the bottom in the, in the source code, I can't get to it very quickly with keyboard unless you automatically move focus to it. I'm of differing views on whether I like autofocus on cookie warnings uh, but some websites do it because they stick the cookie warning as the last item in the source, and then you can't. You have to tap through the whole web page to get to it. So they do that. Um, Charles just asked for a little clarification on stickies. Do you mean the CSS feature of position sticky or position fixed or something else? It's, it's both. Position fixed is almost worse because you can't scroll from side to side. For example, if, if you go to LinkedIn, they have, I believe it's either... I believe it's position fixed at the top of the screen and the thing has a width and then you can't scroll to the right. Position sticky is a little different in that the idea is something starts off not being fixed, but then once you scroll away, it switches to fixed. Uh, I mean both of them because the end result is I have something in my viewport that I can't get rid of. And if, if it gives you the same effect of you stick post-it notes covering part of your monitor and then you can't see the rest of the page, if that's your end effect, that's what you're getting rid of. Those, te those techniques are slightly different from each other, but uh, the end result is what I care about. And usually the same type of media query works for both. What would you say is a good alternative to stickies or position fixed? I guess you could ask why you're fixing stuff. For example, I see social media buttons are sticky on a lot of article websites, news websites, because to them, they may have some kind of an earning thing, money earning thing with getting people to click on those and share stuff. Whereas I always have to go into my developer mode and display and delete the things from the DOM so that I can read the text that's underneath them. And my, my thing is, if something has to be sticky when people are zoomed out, I just don't want it to be sticky. Like, position it with CSS in the place where it's supposed to sit normally. But if I can scroll away from it, or if it can't cover the other text, that's my main thing. It's, it's not really a replacement, because the whole point of sticky is to act like a post-it note stuck to the monitor. And mm -hmm. it depends on your reason for doing that. 
a lot of news sites do it because they want people to always see the name of the site they're on. You could argue that that could have a cognitive benefit, but, and when you're zoomed out, some of them are quite small, so they, they don't look like they're a big problem because, you know, I, what is it, Wall Street Journal or somebody, some of those sites they have this real thin little header at the top and that doesn't look like a big deal. Well, if you zoom into 400% and suddenly it's covering <laughs> half your screen, then you know, okay, that's, that's not cool. Undo that. All righty. Well, we are coming to the end of our hour um, and it seems to be dying out of questions. Uh, thank you, Mallory, for that not only informative but very entertaining talk. Uh, I, I'd still love the slides that say no. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 I have seen it in, in the Dutch version and it, no doesn't seem to carry the weight that neat does. Neat doon. <laughs> it, yeah. It just has this... Uh, gravitas to it for some reason with what you really can't get any more clear than no don't do it um anywho uh next month we're going to have eric bailey on to uh, accessibility advocate and inclusive designer at thoughtbot he'll be on to discuss the intersection of performance and accessibility highlighting the opportunities and techniques to improve website and web app performance by embracing an accessible and inclusive mindset I'm sure we've all seen instances where unnecessarily long and complex code that's in there for God only knows what purpose is put in the production and it affects not only the accessibility of the product, but also the performance. I, I know Mallory knows what I'm talking about. Um, that will be on Wednesday, July 3rd at 11 a.m. Again, Eric Bailey talking about the intersection of performance and accessibility. Thanks again to Mallory and thank you all again for your attendance your questions, your retweets, and general support of technically. I really do enjoy seeing the numbers of the participants uh, go up with each passing month, and we have you to thank for that, for spreading the word. So thanks to Claire from ACS for the captions, and I will see you all next month.